This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast. We have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Mountain Glass Arts. For the month of April 2019, Mountain Glass is offering their Chinese rod and tube at 40% off. You can just get this with no coupon code needed. Just buy it at checkout. It's all taken care of for you. And if you're questioning about the Chinese rod and tube quality, I highly recommend this to anybody and everybody at any level of advancement. The one thing I will say is that the Chinese rod and tube, if you're looking for a high quality refraction and clarity in glass, uh, this is not for you if you're a marble maker or looking for uh, back stack sleeving, that kind of stuff. Um, it's definitely not the best in terms of uh, clarity and uh, that kind of refractiveness that we're looking for glass. But if you're a beginner, if you're do production, that's high-level production. Right now is the time to save a ton of money. It's now also the time to buy freight. You can get six to ten uh, cases put on a pallet, have it shipped to a local area distribution place, or if you have a studio, uh, it's a warehouse facility. They'll ship to you there directly, and it will save you a ton of money. I promise. And for all you beautiful soft glass nerds out there, they have their double helix sale at 15% off. Just use the coupon code Helix H E L I X at checkout. And also, if you have not yet heard, Mountain Glass is expanding their horizons, and they are opening a new location out in Oregon. I believe, as I read, they will be starting off with a retail space and then eventually working out and getting a bigger space uh, uh, as they grow out there. Uh, So we now will have an East Coast and West Coast connection with Mountain Glass Arts. This is amazing to me, uh, not only for them as a company that I have spent a ton of money with and have been very dedicated to over the last 20 years of my life as a glass artist, but also it really goes to show you how the glass industry and the borough industry in particular is growing uh, in leaps and bounds and continues to grow. So congratulations to Mountain Glass for their expansion. And make sure if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you just go to mountainglass.com. That's mountainglass.com. Hey, 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 what's happening? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 213. This is your host, Jason Michael. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Today's episode is featuring Mr. Sam, goes by Crest Bug Glass out there on the social media feeds. He is co-owner and founder of Colorado Color Company. And uh, him and I have a fun conversation about his 10-year journey in glass and then also the forming of Colorado Color Company. And uh, we're going to be bringing Ben on at some point uh, to talk about his journey. And then two guys in that same uh, chit-chat will come on and kind of talk about their their comings together in a sense of uh, the forming of Colorado Color Company, which we do cover a little bit in this interview. Uh, but I want to bring the, both of those guys on to uh, have that formal discussion. I think it'd be a lot of fun. And uh, I was out there myself uh, back in... Uh, February, I believe it was, uh, for my first time seeing snow fall from the sky. My daughter bought her and I uh, round trip tickets for my birthday, and uh, it was a blessing to get out there and uh, meet these cats. And uh, they had a, their brand new studio, which uh, Sam talks about, and uh, got a chance to go in there. And we had an open house and uh, got to break it in, in a sense, by firing up some torches on a new bench. It's just an overall amazing experience and had a lot of fun. And uh, we've been having some discussions about uh, myself going out there and teaching some intro beginning classes and sculpture and what have you. So a lot of things in the works behind the scenes, but I uh, definitely was looking forward to getting Sam on here. We had some technical issues last time we tried doing this. Uh, those of you out there that have the new upgraded iPhones that know about this whole lightning plug bullshit that uh, you have to have an adapter for any kind of uh, coax cable or a plug. And I've used my phone forever and ever for doing my interviews, uh, not my laptop, because my laptop, uh, this Wi-Fi sucks for it out here in the studio. Uh, so I was able to borrow my girl's oh. laptop and make this happen today. So it's definitely glad it worked. And Sam out there in Colorado, just by chance, was having some crazy weather coming through, which he discusses and talks about a little bit. So uh, his signal was in and out. So it went through and edited out some of the breakups and what have you. So if you guys notice a little bit of cuts out here and there that are, don't sound natural, that's pretty much all it was. And that wasn't editing the show necessarily of what he was saying, just trying to make things uh, sound a little seamless 
in a sense. But uh, yeah, that being said, I uh, hope you all are doing well. It's uh, coming into spring, and uh, for here in Florida, it's almost summertime. It's been in the high 80s. Uh, the mornings have been gorgeous, but right now outside it's probably about 85 degrees. So just remember as you all uh, are out in your studios and you're sweating and stuff, make sure you're staying hydrated and cooled down because uh, summertime's kicking in and we all know how much it sucks when uh, it gets so hot that we have to start working in the early mornings and the wee hours of the night, which isn't always a good thing for us. Uh, I know myself personally, I tend to try to just power through the heat and just say fuck it and just stay hydrated have a fan on you, get some cold washcloths, uh, work in three-hour increments and take breaks, you know, that kind of stuff. So things to think about. I always uh, preach about adding a little pinch of some sea salt to your water as well as some lemon. Uh, it helps with the flavor, but the sea salt also helps your uh, your body stay uh, up to speed in terms of uh, not losing all of your minerals and things that you lose uh, in the sodium. That's so important for your body to work properly from all that water that you're peeing out. So just some things to think about. Uh, also, uh, if you guys heard in the ads in the beginning, uh, exciting news about Mountain Glass. They are expanding and growing, which is uh, super awesome. They are now uh, relo- not relocating. They're expanding to the west, the great expansion of Mountain Glass. So now they are in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, and as well out in Oregon, I believe is where they're at. And uh, right now, from what I understand, they're going to start off with a small retail spot that you can go get some materials and supplies from, and then eventually they'll uh, open up a bigger space as a distribution facility, uh, which is pretty badass. It's super exciting. I know myself being as close as I am, I'm pretty spoiled getting two-day uh, deliveries from them. I can order on Wednesday make sure I have it here Friday. And uh, as long as you can get that in at a certain time of the day as well, it's what counts for them as well. Uh, but it's just a lot of fun to see the growth and expansion. And I mentioned in the ad about, you know, a lot of it to me is just seeing the growth in the borough company, but excuse me, but really a lot of it is just the expansion in glass in general. Uh, there's been such a growth and appreciation for this work and the art, not even the pipe scene, but just for glass in general. I can't tell you. Uh, Got to love when people drive through your neighborhood in a loud Harley. But uh, that being said, it's I, I get excited at work when I hear kids or you know talk about seeing things on the social media and I don't know if they're watching pipe makers <laughs> blown glass <laughs> or what's going on. But the fact is that they are still seeing glass being made through in the internet and it's uh you know, all ages and sizes and races and creeds and all that stuff. Everybody has a, a new found appreciation. So for those of us that do this for a full time living, uh, we're all blessed and definitely want to make sure that you know that you're blessed. It's, you know, don't take it for granted. Because as any kind of art, uh, there's ebbs and flows, like in the pipe industry, there's ebbs and flows that goes with art as well. Uh, for 20 to 50 years, it could be glass, and then for another decade or more, it becomes metal. I mean, you never, really never know. So get it while it's good. Make sure you're putting money away to save for retirement, all that kind of stuff. Uh, like I talked to my little Wise Guy Radio Minute in the last episode, uh, episode five. If you have not heard yet, it's uh, talking about the importance of having a little small emergency fund. And it all stemmed from a lower back injury that I've been dealing with, which I still am dealing with right now as I'm sitting here talking to you. Uh, I'm on like day, let's see, Monday, today's Thursday. So day four uh, of going through my healing. And I got to get a little bit of work done today. I had to go to my oxygen company and swap out a tank, which was not fun to do. And I still had to do it. I didn't really have any kind of choice. And, you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Uh, but I also know that now being 43 this year that I'm not a young buck like I used to be. Even though I'm somewhat fit and keep myself in shape, I still uh, don't heal as fast as I used to. And i got to take it easy. So it's just important, again, just to think about things. Take care of your body. Don't push yourself to the limits. Make sure you're getting good sleep. Adequate diet is good. Water, hydration, stretching. And uh, one of the things with my lower back, which I'll pass on to you guys, is the recommendations I've had is no heat whatsoever. Uh, ice packs are beneficial because of the swelling. If you use heat, it actually draws blood to the area, which causes the inflammation to happen even more. And that's what the inflammation is, basically, is that it's, it's the swelling of your tissue that is uh, filled with blood, basically, as it's trying to heal itself. And using ice to helps to alleviate the swelling. Uh, if those that follow sports and watch like a pitcher for a game, uh, after a pitcher has pitched eight, seven, eight innings, uh, their arm is iced up from their shoulder to their hand. And that's because of the overuse and the wear and tear of that particular body part. And they ice it up to help them relieve it. Or you see like football players that take ice baths, you know, that kind of stuff. Just because the ice helps to with uh, your tissues and all the circulations of your systems in your body helps to really uh, calm it all down and help with the inflammation. 
So it's also really important just to make sure that you're wearing adequate shoes in the shop, that you have a good uh, soft something that you're standing on. I have a anti-fatigue mat that I stand on that's super comfortable. Otherwise, I'd be standing on my concrete floor in my garage all the time, uh, and you don't want that. That's terrible for your back. If you're sitting, if you're standing, whatever you're doing, just make sure you're paying attention to your posture, that you're not hunched over your torch, you know, all that kind of stuff. And if you do that for so long, it's eventually going to wear and tear, and it's not going to allow you to do this anymore, and also helps to overdevelop certain muscles, which then throws your entire posture off. So just some things to think about, and it's, again, this is all fresh right now in, in my system, so I'm sharing it with you as I experience this stuff, which I tend to do. Uh, also, if you have not yet subscribed to The Flow Magazine, one of our other sponsors for the show, make sure you do. They just had their uh, marbles and paperweight issue came out, which was uh, amazing seeing what they had in this issue. It was uh, some beautiful work. And uh, they had their spring issue coming out soon, which is their nature issue, which is a lot of fun. And then eventually they'll have their women's in glass, and then they'll have their functional issue, and then it goes in the circulation of every quarter. So again, if you have not you have subscribed to The Flow Magazine, make sure you do, because I highly recommend them. Uh, if you've ever wanted to have any work published, anything you've written published, any tutorials, any of that kind of stuff, uh, this is a great magazine to get yourself into and uh, get some notoriety and your voice out there in a sense. Uh, so just go to theflowmagazine.com. You can use promo code WISEGUY, that's W-Y-Z-G-U-I at checkout. It'll save you 10% off your subscription. You can get this subscription in digital form or paper as well, or both. And I recommend the paper version only because it's nice to have a magazine uh, in your hands instead of reading things on your phone or your tablets or your computers, you know, like the old days. And uh, what else? Uh, trade show season's over with. So uh, it's coming up soon, though. Got Glass Roots. I heard that they are in, uh, I've heard that they're in New Orleans, but then I've also heard they're in Nashville. I got to do a little research, uh, but I'm pretty sure Asheville is where they're going to be this year. And, uh, I'm marking my calendars off this time around for this next year to make sure that I get to the trade shows. I make sure I get to the gas conferences. This next gas, gas conference, from what I understand, is in Switzerland or Sweden. Um, so not going to be making that one. But uh, next time it's in the States, I definitely will be there. I feel like an asshole for not going to this last one, especially when it was in my hometown. But just the way my scheduling works at work and not asking time off in advance like I should have, uh, I definitely dropped the ball on that one. And main reasons I want to go to these things is for you all just to get some content and get some information and share uh, what's going on out there in the world of glass. And that being said, uh, if you want to help support this show, uh, we have a Patreon page. You can go to patreon.com forward slash wise guy radio. We still have our two patrons in there. Our wise asses, as I like to call them, they are getting exclusive content and video work. Uh, only found in Patreon, even though we have the YouTube channel that is up and going. Uh, the videos that are going to be on YouTube are going to be more about uh, everything and anything about glass blowing, including tutorials. Uh, but the Patreon page is a place and a community that I want to grow. Uh, and it's for as little as a dollar a month you can get in there and help support the show. And that's $12 a year. So if you think about the math and every penny that is uh, going through that account goes right back into this podcast, whether it's buying lighting or buying new equipment to upgrade the shows, help pay for trips to get around and about, uh, because this is not free for me on my end, I definitely have a hefty bill every month that I have to pay to run the show and uh, get this things going. And my co-producer, uh, John, will be here today. We're going to be doing some more filming, uh, getting episode one for the YouTube channel, the top five reasons why you should not be a glass blower. Uh, up and running. That'll be out this weekend. Uh, on Sunday, we're going to publish that. And I'm not sure what our publishing schedule is going to be, but that's going to be more consistent of a publishing schedule than we uh, than I have for this podcast. And the main reason is just because John and I can get on a good schedule, a routine with video work, and he's going to be doing all the editing for that. Where with the podcast, it's uh, just lining up uh, guests and timing on my schedule and their schedule and making things happen, technical difficulties happen, all those other sh things that go in. So... Uh, just super excited to share all that. And uh, for those right now, follow me on Instagram at jmichaelglass. That's J-M-I-C-H-A-E-L glass. I am pushing uh, my account, doing a giveaway to get to 11,000 followers. Uh, I realized I had a ton of people that were following me that were all bot accounts. And I've slowly, uh, as those accounts went away, I went under 10,000 followers. And it's not that I care how many followers I have. Only reason I really do care about how many followers I have is once you hit the 10,000 mark, uh, it allows you to have more access to things in your story posts, uh, including links and uh, different things for the Instagram stories and what have you. So I would like to get it up to 11,000. That way, if there's anybody that leaves the account and fluctuates, uh, it doesn't drop below 10,000. So uh, 420 is going to be my giveaway. I'm giving away a uh, one of my newest Wise Guy pendants that I have. I posted this up on my Instagram the other day. Uh, I have a new t-shirt line that's dropping on Monday. 
Uh, the first shirt is about having, it just says, have a wise day. It has my fun little wise guy logo on there. And this on the back of it, it says, hashtag support your local glass artist. And uh, these shirts, all every sale for these shirts are going to be, again, the money will be going right back into this podcast to help fund and grow this show. And this gives me a chance to offer you all stuff. And uh, going back to the Patreon page, if you're a member in Patreon, uh, whether you're the dollar or $5 or $10 level, uh, you immediately get a 15% off discount to any of our merchandise that we will be selling in the store. So again, for $12 a year, that $12 right there can just pay for that one shirt that will then you'll save money on it. And you'll also then have uh, access to uh, content. Now the video content is only for those that are in the $10 range. And that's just because, uh, you know, as an incentive for that, but it's also again, $120 a year. Uh, if you think about webinars that you would pay for that costs anywhere from 50 to hundred dollars for one webinar for $120 for the year, you can have access to uh, all these exclusive videos and tutorials and tips and tricks and what have you. Uh, and also to be have the chance to uh, give me your feedback and for things that you would like, I go in there and say, hey, what do you guys want this month? And I get feedback. And then I get the stuff up there. So super excited about the growth and everything going. I'm going to be way more consistent. My head is uh, a lot clearer than it was a month ago and uh, just feeling really good right now and immensely, and mentally and in an emotional state. And uh, it's just so important. Uh, those that haven't uh, haven't heard, I have uh, quit smoking pot, and uh, I still do a, a, a CBD spray every morning and every night. And other than that, uh, I've stopped smoking just because for me, uh, the old marijuana is not for my brain chemistry. It does not allow me to uh, get focused and get things done. If anything, it's more of a distraction and I don't like the, the feeling of living in a cloud. And also for myself personally, I think too, a lot of it had to do with uh, using it to avoid specific things in my life uh, that I just had to deal with and uh, I didn't want to. And uh, that shit has been dealt with. So if you got shit to deal with and you're finding that you're smoking pot to cover and mask those things, I recommend highly, if you want to be the best you, to stop and take care of that shit. It's so important. So that being said, I'm going to stop rambling. Love you so much. Enjoy this interview with Sam. You can find, again, Sam on the social webs at Crestbug. I'll have his links in the show notes and everything else about Colorado Company, as well as my information for the Patreon links and for my giveaway I'm doing to get to 11,000 on Instagram. Love you all so much. Have a wise day. Stay hydrated. Talk to you soon. Peace. going on sam welcome to the show hey how's it going jason good brother it's uh take two for us here it's having some technical difficulties over the last couple of weeks so i appreciate your patience and uh coming back on and now on your end you guys got a freaking crazy ass typhoon late winter <laughs> yes breeze thing going on so hopefully we can make it through cyclone bomb i guess they call it <laughs> yeah uh, don't you love these terms <laughs> they, what, yeah the sounds, weather folks. sounds serious <laughs> Polar vortex, is, you know, cyclo bombs, man, what the fuck? Yeah, you know, we might not, you know, it is a different kind of storm than we normally have here. Real windy, snow's getting drifted instead of kind of sitting. So, it, you know, it, we've had two of them. So it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, a little bit further in the uh, the chit chat here, we'll talk about where you're actually located at and, uh, you know, what's going on in your life currently. But in the meantime, before we get all sidetracked here, if you want to get us started here by giving us your superhero origin story and how you're introduced to the flame. Awesome. Um, yeah, you know, it all started in about 2010. Um, my good buddy, Jake Gross and uh, Ben Thomas, um, they go by Gross Glass and Smash Glass. They had uh, taken a class from Stephen Tillman down in the Longmont um, Berthet area, came back, built out a little studio in their house. And uh, at that time, I was heavy into painting, already super into art for a bunch of years, you know. Uh, started hanging around. Finally, one day, you know, Smash let me touch the flame. And uh, 
it was all over from there. So then there was three of us, one spot in a garage on a little red max, you know, all fighting for time. Nice. Um, these guys were he heavily invested in it. And I was like the third wheel. And uh, so we built another spot and I borrowed a torch uh, a little over under Nortel from my good friend, Mikey Kaplan, Flare Glass, um, who I'd, I'd known and been taking. He was a little older. He's been taking me to panic shows since I was a kid and stuff. Kind of turned me on to the whole scene. He lent me a little over under Nortel. So we built another spot and then, you know, that became crowded. And then, uh, I guess Timberline studios number one started, we went and rented a little spot, uh, about 600 square feet built out a bench four spaces and, uh, you know, just went at it from there. Oh yeah. It's kind of back up real quick, man. It's interesting with, uh, talking about white with, with uh, widespread panic because like before i got into glass myself i was i was kind of in the hippie culture at the time like in the early mid 90s and uh, at the time i was doing a lot of like macrame jewelry i had a couple female friends of mine that worked at this head shop and stuff so i was starting to see some glass it was actually when chameleon was first like one of the first distributors that were driving around in their station wagon slinging glass out of the back of it and stuff so i started seeing some of the stuff that was being produced coming out of the West Coast, but I wasn't quite into the music as much. I was hearing it, but not really. And then I started becoming introduced to it, and my friend Molly was like, hey, I got tickets for Widespread Panic. I'm like, I don't know who they are, but that sounds like fun. Let's go. <laughs> I had no idea yeah, what I was getting myself into, bro. I mean, literally, I was like, and I was in this amazing space with a bunch of people that were, I mean, I think her and I maybe were like one of like 100 and like th that were in the culture and everybody else was there for just the music itself like a lot of older folks and literally oh, by yeah. the end of the night bro i was in just a pair of jeans just dancing my ass off in this fucking <laughs> up in the balcony you know oh yeah panic's a good time I, you know i've seen uh lots of panic shows now we do red rocks every year i did the three night run of red rocks for you know 10 right. or 11 years straight so we have a lot of good music here in colorado too just with red rocks and you know denver all all the front range you know so yeah man music seen to definitely came through yeah it's amazing to have that that kind of you know introduction into the culture in a sense you know just through music and then all of a sudden it's like you see this vast amazing beautiful community of artists and all this diversified things going on it's uh and then all of a sudden you're yeah. you're a pipe maker <laughs> yeah I know. All <laughs> you know sudden, all of a sudden you're just like uh stuck behind the porch yeah so uh, early on, what? Because so I know like your background, you're doing a lot of graffiti and painting and stuff, you know, and and having I hadn't. It's kind of funny because before this, you sent me your bio. I hadn't really seen your work before, and seeing your work when you were telling me about the, you know, when we first were chatting about the painting, I can totally see that in your style. So like early on in your you know creative space and glass, like what were some of the first things you were making? Oh man, you know, so like I was born in California, and. Uh, I moved to Colorado and, you know, the beginning of junior high and I moved up into the mountains up above horse tooth, uh, reservoir in Fort Collins. I think you, you went and visited while you were here. Very beautiful area. Yeah. We saw the mountain uh, lion signs. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was, <laughs> that went nationwide. That guy <laughs> yeah. got attacked and took that mountain lion out. That was pretty heavy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I ended up living right next to where that happened actually up in horse tooth mountain park estates is where my parents house was up on a dirt road and you know just like the one thing that really hit me was like there was no graffiti you know it's like colorado is beautiful in its own way but in cali i lived like right off the 101 between the 101 and the beach and like you know the creek behind my house was all graffiti and i was like i always thought it was cool that someone would take the time you know out of their life to go paint something colorful somewhere you know and when i moved to colorado it was like there's no graffiti um, so it just it captivated me and it just, uh, there's not a lot to do up in the mountains. So I just started drawing, you know, my stepmom, love her, great woman. She, uh, was an artist also she totally encouraged me to just draw, create whatever, you know, have a good time. And, um, so I got heavy into graffiti, you know, there was a, a thing online called art crimes and it's a lot like glasspipes.org and okay. it was artcrimes.org. And it was like, you know, you go on there, upload your your photos. So I'm sitting in the mountains, you know, miles from any city, looking at all this like city style graffiti being heavily inspired. And I guess that that just rolled into a lot of canvas painting, you know, sketchbook, black book, you know, just a lot of drawing, you know, nice. it, was, it was good. Did you take any kind of like formal classes with the uh, with art like that? 
No, you know, um, I had a couple really good art teachers through high school, a couple bad ones. And, uh, you know, I was, my parents were trying to encourage me to go to art school in Denver, the Denver Institute of Art. And we went down there and looked at it. And at the time, I was so heavily into graffiti. We went in the gallery and it was like, all the art looked the same and you know i didn't realize people are practicing techniques and learning styles and doing this but to me at that age being into graffiti i was like man i want to do like, like different stuff you know like i want to be different than all these people i don't want to learn the normal way hindsight i really wish i would have gone <laughs> to art school for the fundamentals right. um, but you know it is what it is and you know, life just rolls like that sometimes you know but I, I do agree, though, in terms of art school, because like I've like myself personally, I've taken art classes in college just to, for the like you're saying for the same thing, or like for the fundamentals of the of the instruction. But I've I've found a lot of a lot of friends of mine over the years that took art school. It didn't go beyond, you know, like their bachelor's basically. That they kind of continue the style of their teacher and not really their own personal style. But I had friends that went through, it which is got, great too. You know, that's that can be a great thing as well. You know, continuing yeah, for sure. It. The style. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess in terms of even with glass, you know, the whole, like, I think I keep saying Joe Scar that made the quote, and I, I, I'm pretty sure it was him, but the whole idea of the imitating until you can innovate, you know, until you can really find, you know, fine tune, and then you can begin to refine your own style. It's, you know, I'm sure in a sense, hindsight, you know, you really had hoped that you, uh, you could have gone to that. But do you think like if you had, you know, because I think we all make choices in life, and there's reasons, and then things happen, obviously, you know, do you think that you would have was that like pre glass in terms of the discussion of? Oh yeah, you know, yeah. We're talking, you know, ten years prior, maybe at least five. Okay. I, you know, I didn't really get into glass till I was about twenty-five years old. Is when it kind of fell in my lap. Okay. Yeah, that makes so sense. So we're talking fresh, fresh out of high school, you know, eighteen, less seventeen, eighteen. I think I went down, was checking out art schools. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting to kind of get a view into like the ultimate or alternate dimensional plane where that life of you exists, where you went to art school. To <laughs> yeah, that actually, would be a trip, right? You know, to see if you actually became a glassblower. <laughs> yeah, huh. Yeah, I get, you know, things just fall into place, you know, you yeah. just got to let life happen sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. But at least you still continue to, you know, to do your work, which it seems like, you know, being what you're saying, you know, you became inspired and you still continued to to be creative and, and put, you know, paint on canvas. And I had almost yeah. utmost respect yeah. for that, bro. Cause I can't paint for, to save my fucking life. I can like color theory, that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm educated in it, but when it comes to actually applying that to my work, especially even in glass, like I have trouble applying color theory to my own specific work. It's frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just that practice makes perfect kind of, yeah. You know, it's like, I just constantly do I always have. So it's like whether I'm painting or not, if there's a pen and a paper around, you, uh, you might expect that your pad of paper is going to be destroyed. <laughs> Some pretty poor art yeah. or maybe drawing. a good one. You never know. But I'm just constantly drawing. It's, I don't even know if I could not do it. It's weird. It's weird. You know, I'm in the same way, dude. I'm always sketching. You know, it's, it's my way yeah. of passing time, but also my way of just getting shit out of, out of my head. Yeah, just doodling, sketching, whatever it might be. Yeah, fuck yes. And, yeah, man. So like, kind you know, of, I, uh, I, go on. I feel like the older I've got, you know, the, the better my colors have become. And, you know, the more I've focused on refining my glasswork and color and that kind of stuff, it's also helped me become a better painter, too, or, you know, just drawer in general. Interesting. Um, I, I completely I agree. Know. I think it has to do with going from a two-dimensional to three-dimensional. And once you can create three-dimensional, it gives you a better perspective of 2D in a sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. like, I deal with, we have some silhouette artists at work. And the... I am absolutely blown away by how someone can sit and look at a person's profile and get a piece of paper and a pair of scissors and cut a fucking uh, profile, you know, in a silhouette. It's just, it's incredible watching these ladies do it, but they're blown away that I can take a two dimensional thing and create 3d out of it. So I think it kind of goes back and forth and the more you do it, the more you refine it, the better you get at both. Yeah. Yeah. It goes both ways. Yeah. So, so I guess fast forward then to, you know, you guys are, having a triple t triple tag team match with the red max you know and then, and, then, <laughs> yeah. and then you get your own torch so like i guess at that point in time you know when you started doing your own thing what were you uh getting into making oh man you know um it's that learning learning how to make just basic stuff you know like i was just pumped on making 
a hitter, a spoon, or something functional, you know, like, uh, wigwags really intrigue me, line work, you know, it reminded me of graffiti a lot, you know, mm-hmm. like, uh, Adam G, Big Z, Worm, all kind of local dudes were doing these big graffiti-ass pieces, you know, and, like, I, I totally wanted to do that, kind of style was inspired by it, you know, um, so I just started off making whatever I could, uh, fortunately, a lot of a lot of little spoons, hitters, marbles, stuff to sell to keep going, yeah. and then you know, just eventually built and built with my skill set, and my skill level is that built, you know. Um, really, cool. you know, I can I could always draw a really cool piece. I could never, you know, to this day, I'm still working on making <laughs> making right. them out of glass. <laughs> like I could sit down and like draw, you know, several different angles of a piece to scale executing it in glass is a whole different story <laughs> yeah dude like i see some guys do like cad drawings on a computer of like whatever bubbler like i, used to, I had actually had a, a customer of mine send me his cad drawings of like his ideas that he had it's like bro this is some scientific technical shit like you know, <laughs> easy to draw it, yeah buddy yeah that holds better on paper kind of thing you know <laughs> yeah yeah i definitely you know i draw everything not everything but if i have a piece that i want to make to scale or something i definitely use graph paper out put it on the bench while i'm making it so you know hold everything up to it it's like definitely big on drawing drawing your art out to scale on graph paper um it really helps me keep everything tight in the way i want it and the way i envisioned it first try you know without having to make it and be like oh that's a little too big that's a little too small yeah smart so, yeah, because nothing worse yeah. than trying to make like matching horns, you know, and you got one in the kiln that's hot, and you're trying to like think about how big that fucking thing was. And if you just have it on paper, you know, you can just kind of hold it over it, and and then you can kind of adjust as yeah. you need to, you know. Yeah, definitely. Hell yeah! So I guess from that point, then, you know, seeing your work where it is now, you you obviously have incorporated this graffiti in your art, in your painting, in yeah. a sense, you know, into your work. So at what point in time down the road did that start happening? Um, you know, only a couple years ago, I started really getting into just like focusing on, on drawing, you know, with Stringer, got a couple good tips from some good friends on some techniques, you know, there wasn't a lot of information at the time going around some filler videos, you know, we did some webinars with like Yush and Nady, um, through Glasscraft, but it was like fillas. So, you know. Um, there wasn't a lot of information going out around about drawing, so I just I just started trying trying it, and it was really frustrating. I'm not gonna not gonna lie about that one. Um, yeah, it's incredible. It's, I have the utmost respect. Like I took a, my brother and I both uh, took a quill cool, uh, cool class, and he was talking, you know, showing us how had a, a general basic idea on just like starting off by doing little like uh, you know doing little dots and stuff like to kind of outline your image, you know, in a sense. And, you know, you can knock them off and flick them off if they're, you know, instead of melting them completely in. But then he started telling us about JWC and all the stuff he was doing and how intricate his work was and spending like 40 hours on a pennant. And if one little thing went wrong, he'd fucking knock in his water bucket and start all over again, you know? Yeah, that that dude is on some different shit for sure, dude. Yeah. He is uh, definitely one of the dudes... uh, I look up to for just cleanliness, technical ability, all of the above, you know, his functionals and his drawings are just, you know, yeah, can't sh- beat that. Shit's incredible. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it's, and it's been fun too, to see like through the evolution of this industry and how more people are teaching, you know, like him, you know, and, and you know, you see other artists now kind of coming out and incorporating that kind of work in their own styles, but they're not, imitating somebody else they're using their own specific you know per, like perspective i guess i'm trying what i'm looking for here and so yeah you know, def- do you find like as you kind of evolve through your work that you then felt like you were kind of ready in a sense to kind of put that perspective into your work yeah definitely you know once my my skill set caught up to my drawing ability and i felt you know it was kind of a little more on um started drawing a lot you know it, you know, it's, it's still, it's the, where I'm at with it. I don't get paid very good on it by any means. It's very time consuming. Uh, like you said, you know, a lot of it ends up in the water bucket. A lot of it's flawed. The tiniest little thing, you know, you roll a little bit of color over one of your outlines and like, you can't get that back, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, 
<laughs> it is what it is, you know. I'm just I'm working at it, trying to get better, trying to stay positive, you know. Is it the, you know there's there's a high that comes with nailing a drawing too, you know. If you spend so much time focused and you know focusing your energy on one thing, you know, to yeah. nail one is just like this greatest feeling in the world. Yeah, man, I completely agree, and I think that that having that feeling, like I still get butterflies sometimes when I'm at the, like finished a piece and I'm going to the kiln to put it away, like adrenaline's pumping, you know, and you're super excited, but you're also kind of freaking out because you'd want this thing to drop or go in the kiln and hear yeah. cracking sounds and Bunch, shit. You, know? you, you you know you've dropped one too, right? Uh, right, dude, finish in the tongs. <laughs> the fucking worst is that when you write, because I make my own Kevlar uh, tong wrapped, you know, thingies, finishing tools, and the worst is like forgetting to kind of season them in a sense with the flame to make it not so slick. And I've dropped. Hey, you back. Yeah, yeah, we're we're really getting a little poor connection, but yeah. I can still kind of hear you. Cool, but yeah, I, there's definitely I've I've definitely dropped a couple pieces because I forgot to season them and get them so that they were grippy, and I, it just slips out of my fucking tongs on the way to the kiln. It's like, man, motherfucker. <laughs> you know? I, do yeah, I think everybody's everybody's dropped a finished piece. Yeah, and going I, into the kiln. The worst though, bro, is I do it at Disney sometimes, and you know you Ooh. got fucking forty people watching you do this shit. It's, it's sometimes I, I I can I'm glad it happens. To, I hate which I hate to say that, but it gives them appreciation that not everything we make comes out, and they can see why we charge what we charge for our shit. But inside, I'm like, man, this fuck, this is some fucking bullshit, amateur shit right here. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, it, did. it happens to the best of us, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. So I guess uh, to kind of back up too, early on when you were, you know, making your oneies and your spoons and stuff, what was your way of uh, kind of selling and marketing your stuff? Was it to friends, wholesalers, you know, shops in town? Um, You know, at the beginning, it was just like we'd hit the road with the receipt book, hit every shop on the front range, you know? try to go make relationships selling just proto you know try to get by buy a new torch new kiln you know turn turn your money over into more tools be able to live and eat you know but yeah it just started with the local shops and then until the trade shows you know and then we picked up some serious wholesalers back when trade shows were good you know Mm -hmm. back when you sell the whole table and take 10 10k in orders and stuff like that you know yeah um, the so good kinda, old days. Yeah, good old days when the trade shows were a viable source. Yeah. <laughs> they still can be, you know. Yeah, yeah, totally. Just got to do it right. Got to evolve with the yeah. times. Yeah, yeah, constant progression. Yeah, man. So I, I guess, you know, kind of in terms of evolving and, and your color work, did you find that you really were trying to, like, focus on that kind of stuff as well in your in your early work? Or was it more like refining the techniques first yeah, before you started to really... Man, I, you know? yeah, I guess I was just... I was. I was really inspired by that big old school bubbler horn line work style, you know, and like drawing didn't even seem feasible, you know, (laughs) until I saw other people doing it. So, you know, um, I was really just, yeah, figuring out how to work colors, you know, doing big, whooshy, horny pieces that were kind of like inspired by the people I looked up to, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I remember when like Cowboy uh, started doing some of that stuff, you know, just like the the full wigwags, but then like the crazy ass wigwagged horns that were going along with them, you know, just yeah, crazy. And then like Nate Dizzle was doing his big ass shit and Chris Cross, oh, yeah, you know, like all those. Sure. I own I own a Dizzle piece, yeah. Um, love that dude's work. You know, Colton, Big Z, Jason Lee, Yush, Adam G, all those dudes were like doing this big just grand pipe stuff that was really impressing to me you know it reminded me of graffiti is really another thing it was like 3d graffiti piece you know so yeah that's really what oh, go on. what brought me in yeah like you mentioned david colton like his his work has always to me has been like you know his that's obviously his style is that graffiti style you know he's a graffiti glass artist you know and yeah. it's it's amazing to see just the curves and turns and twists and you know all these welds and seals and looking at the stuff and I've never actually seen his work like I've seen it in person but like next like not hold held it in my hand and I've always wondered like you know looking at some of this stuff like early on I was seeing all these attachments and stuff I'm like man is all this shit hollow is it solid like what's all going on here and how do these things function you know and then I started understanding about you know the sculptural aspect or adding horns to something and those were all just like solid like making a little character and the arms and legs were actually solid. They weren't all hollow. So as technical yeah, as it could of, be, you know, it didn't have to be. 
a lot of my first big pieces were like that. It would have like a, you know, a little functioning section in it. And then there'd, there'd be hollow horns and whooshes and wheel and all this stuff all over it that just had holes popped in it. And a lot of people were like tripped out by, you know, what was actually part of the piece. But you kind of tuck the function down in there. Mm-hmm you know up in your design and then just cover it and you know style i guess <laughs> yeah that's the one thing about buck too i love, I love about his work you know it, it really hides yeah. the function in terms of sculpture yeah banjo aspect. banjo too yeah, you yeah, know yeah. Um, those builds he's been doing lately are just crazy um but same concept little you know the body's the the functioning part and then he's just embellishing around it very, very cool you know yeah absolutely so I guess in terms of your production lines early on, were you doing like a run of something that was super consistent or were you just kind of free balling it and, you know, having fun with it? For like the proto and stuff back in the day? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah, back in the day. Yeah, you, you know, just like frit hitter, fucking frit spin, a lot of frit proto, you know, start, that's like start started with. And then, you know, it moved into like, we got a lathe at one point. I guess I'll get to that in the color company story. We got a lathe, so then it turned into, you know, oil rig proto. And I still make a ton of proto this day just to stay in the shop, stay alive, feed my family, you know. Yeah. We got a little little girl now, so uh, having the money coming in is very important, you know, to, to keep this all going. So I, I'll do whatever, you know. Up to this day, I would go make a fritz spoon if I needed to, you know. Yeah, and that's that's what I'm asking, man. Because like you know, in terms of perspective of of a newer artist out there, or someone that's been doing it for five years, you know, at the time, right now maybe not so much as it was, say, even just I mean, five years ago when you know when the rigs were really blown up and the and people were getting a ton of fucking money for stuff, you know, it's like you know everybody would want to just jump into making rigs right away without having to learn the basic fundamentals and i i kind of wonder those that did that if either they're still in the game or if they realize they had to go way the fuck back to the very beginning and almost kind of <laughs> start over in a sense to really understand like hey i gotta learn how to do rap and rakes and fritz spoons you know that kind of shit so you know like, i have seen i've seen some kids come through our shop that came in that heavy rig era and like that i feel like the rig at one point became like the spoon yeah and uh you know, I have seen them revert and learn how to make spoons and make that cheap proto. And, uh, you know, they're they're getting to the same spot, maybe just a little different path. Cool. Yeah, and it's funny you say, like, the rig was a spoon because, in a sense, price-wise, the rig has become the spoon. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. totally. It's, fuck, it's, it's so crazy, it's, man. It's competitive, it's competitive out there. You really got to depend on, you know, solid accounts some good relationships i feel like yeah and the relationship aspect is like one of the things i preach about the most man just you know keeping a good rapport with shops keeping in touch with them you know not selling them yeah. janky shit and if you do sell them janky shit, professional being yeah, clean totally. you know all of the above makes a happy a uh, happy buyer <laughs> yeah i mean the fact that you mentioned you guys had a, a, a invoice book like i used to give shops i used to use an online uh app thing i would just print out you know I'm like hey you guys have a printer and I'd email them my thing and they'd print out the invoice and they're like, we wish artists would just walk in here with a fucking receipt book, you know, so <laughs> a piece of paper and a pencil, you know, it's like, dude, they gotta, people got to step their game up. It's so it's just, in yeah, a step, I, learned, it's professional. I, learned, I learned that from smash, <laughs> you know, he's definitely uh, been a big mentor, you know, turned me on to the whole thing. So he, he was toting the fucking receipt book and uh, definitely turned me on to that. Plus about a bazillion other things down the road, right. but you know, <laughs> that was one of the more professional things that, you know, especially with the times changing now, it's like shops more and more want professionalism. They want tax stuff. They, you know, it's like we're moving into less of a gray area with this whole thing and more of a professional, professional kind of thing. So it's, you know, it's been, it's been different adapting to it, you know? Yeah. Tell me about it, bro. 20 years of watching the evolution going from, you know, underground to above ground to back to underground to above ground and then legalized. It's like, it's been, <laughs> it's been crazy, you know, and it's, and it's gone from art and it's, it's still art, but it's gone from art to industry. And you got to, yeah. again, you got to be able to evolve, man, especially now with all the electronic stuff coming out, you know, with, I think Puffco was awesome with their piece that they made to allow glass artists to incorporate their art into their machine instead of just having like a vape pen kind of thing. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I enjoy that convenience. I, I, I'm yet to make a Puffco attachment. Um, you know, just like any free time I get, I'm trying to focus on uh, doing the art art stuff. And we have a pretty big production line that comes out of our shop that I always got, <laughs> I always got production work, I guess, if, yeah. I, if I need it. 
do you guys like do you do you find that you still have like s some of the same accounts that you've had for you know since early on oh yeah of course you know um <sighs> Yeah, we, the, you know, there's a head shop in town called The Joint Morgan over there. She, I remember when she opened the store, it was like two cases. And, you know, she'd buy like $150 worth of pipes from every artist in town just to be nice. And uh, we've had a great relationship for, man, I don't know, you know, decade almost now, as long as I've been blowing glass. And she, now she has two stores, crushing it. She buys a whole custom line of tubes and rigs from us with her decal on it. Um, and it's like that with several, several other shops and, and a distributor or two, you know, it's like old, old relationships that, um, you know, you just, just be real and a good person and take care of business, be professional and things last, you know? Yeah, but, dude. But one, the I... one thing I see oh, quality work and it, you know, it, yeah, really I, affects uh, people wanting to buy glass from you, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I find, too, like those, because I have a couple of accounts myself. I mean, I, I haven't sold pipes much less, you know, my glass to shops in probably over two years. But I had, early on, I had shops, and they were willing to buy the garbage I was making early on because they knew they could see my drive and my passion for what I was doing. And they helped support me get to a point to where I was able to upgrade my torch to what I have now. I mean, the same Carlisle I've been rocking for 20 years now almost. You know, and then they were, oh, yeah. they were like the first, you know, I'd go to them. They'd be the first shops that started getting the better quality stuff. You know, it got dibs in a sense on stuff. And, you know, it's, it's fun to have, you know, as your relationship evolves, your glass is evolving as well because they're supporting your, you know, your habit in a sense to allow you to do that. And it's, you know, there's nothing better than that, man. And, and no matter if it's 10 years or two years or 20 years, just to keep those relationships strong is so important. And then you mentioned also, which I think is killer is that you guys started creating a custom line of tubes for them with their logo on it. And that's those are the little kind of things, those little nuances of like a, like a side hustle in a sense that I think is so important, you know, to approach your shops and say, hey, I can do this. You know, you can go find someone that can print out vinyl stickers for you if you can't afford to buy the machine, you know, and sandblast a little logo of their name on a pipe. Now, with you know, yeah. Colorado is different with, with the legality of things now, you know, because they can have that on a pipe. Where like in Florida, for instance, a lot of shops, because I used to approach shops with that, and they were like, yeah, we don't really know if we want to have someone getting arrested <laughs> with our name on the piece, you know, kind of thing. That makes sense. I never thought about it like that. <laughs> you know, so I, yeah, and living here in Florida, man, it's... But, it's you been... know, that that custom decal line's been good for us, you know? And it's, you know, it's given, given the people what they want in, in the sense of uh, the shop production, you know? It's mm -hmm. like, if you're making production it's like better to walk in there and kind of be like, what do you need? What can I make for you? You exactly. know, um, yeah. instead of being like, I, I have, I have this Buy it, you know, if you have a good relationship with them and you're comfortable talking, you know, and just, yeah, you know, throwing, throwing ideas out there. No dude. It's, and that's, that's, I did a five part series on, it was called, so you want to be a glass blower. And part of it was like when you move into a new town, that you're not familiar with the shops and that's, you know, you go out and you, if you look at, look at the shops in your area and you go in there and don't tell them you're a glass blower, but just kind of fill them out and take notes, mental notes. And then eventually you oh, can yeah, go look in there at the and cases, look at the prices, you know, it's yeah. like you want to be, you don't want to be underselling your glass. You don't want to be overselling your glass and it, it might change state to state, you know? So yeah. it's like, you want to, I don't know, you do want to kind of scout the head shop a little bit and uh, feel, feel them out, I guess, to a degree. Yeah, because nothing's worse, man, than walking into a, sh a store and be like, "Hey, I'm a fucking glass blower, man. You guys want to buy some shit?" You know, it's, and they're like, oh, "Get the fuck out of here." <laughs> yeah, you know? especially with the the amount of glass blowers now, especially in Colorado, it's uh, easy to get turned away if you come in with the wrong attitude. You know? Yeah, man, that's what I was kind of curious too with with asking about you know the relationships because fucking, I mean, just Denver alone. It's like such a saturated place in an economy of pipes and glass blowers, and you know Fort Collins, where you guys are out, you know, out in the boondocks out there. It's maybe not as much. However, Colorado overall has a lot of fucking glass blowers over there, and it's you know it's it's understandable why people oh, yeah. want to move there for the laws. But it's kind of like my like I told my brother when he was told you know mentioned he was moving out there. I'm like I was super happy for him because he was getting the hell out of Florida, but going to Colorado as a pipe maker, as a new pipe maker in a sense too, you know, finding his way was a huge risk. Obviously yeah, was, you you're know, coming, you're coming to the Thunderdome of uh, yeah. pipe sales here. You know, <laughs> right way to put it. Be on, on your uh, a game if you want to sell some pipes, but you know, Jared, he's got a great work at work at work ethic and uh, yeah. does great work. So he's, he's fit in well, you know, out yeah, here. Yeah. 
Yeah, sells absolutely. sells work online and the shop, so he's like he's doing great. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, because uh, I know right now in the economy and the industry, there's a lot of artists, high end and low end artists that are struggling out there right now, and it's you know I don't know if it's if it's a perspective, an attitude, you know, or unable to let go of like, five years ago. You know what I mean? Like it's it's interesting. Yeah, I, I yeah I have no idea what would cause one one certain person to struggle, but it could be a multitude of things for different people, I guess. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You just gotta stay current and stay relevant. Yeah, I, guess. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, and be willing to do whatever. You know, it's like I'm in the sh- touching glass, but it's not always art glass. You know, yeah. it might be that stacks or proto or whatever it might be. But I'm in the shop. I'm touching glass. I'm learning. You know, I'm talking about glass, conversing with my shop mates. I'm in the I'm in the scene, so it's worth it to me just to be in the glass shop. You know, I'll do whatever I have to do to be here. You know, I love it. Yeah, yeah. I would change it for the world. Hell yeah. So that being said with the shopmates, so obviously, you know, you, the three of you guys were still together, you know, as you're, as you're working as a, you know, a, tri- a triple tag team in a sense. And, you know, yeah, and yeah. Guys, we started our first little studio together. Yeah. So, so going from the one little space and one torch to two torches. So at that point in time, like what'd you guys do to, to grow from there? Um, you know, it got cramped and I, I, I was like, man, let's go rent a space. And we ended up, uh, renting a little 600 square foot you know i think they they rent them for storage now they, they won't even rent them to like working businesses yeah. they're so small um it was pretty much a storage unit in the 600 feet and really included a little mezzanine um so it was really only about 400 square feet but we crammed a table in there you know some k tanks and a couple propane bottles and we went we went for it for a couple years you know from about 2011 to 2013 we were in the little timberline shop just learning you know was it a wide wide storage unit or was it deep no it was like long and deep yeah like the tunnel (laughs) yeah like the tunnel (laughs) and we went we went and put a big square table right in the middle of it nice how'd you guys ventilate that thing um you know we went to this place called uncle benny's and was like a secondhand junkyard you know town over and we went and got 18 inch spiral duct um an old greenhouse van and uh framed up a hole in the wall for the greenhouse van connected it to this duct and then we had a six by ten hood built out of a by a friend down in denver and we connected all it actually was really good ventilation for our first shop yeah, because most uh, like storage units, I'm thinking like you know concrete walls or whatever, and you can't cut holes in them. And because I actually I looked into that myself early on was like a storage unit because I thought man, it's like forty bucks a month it might cost me to rent this place, you know, type of thing. But yeah. uh, I couldn't figure out how to ventilate it except for to hang like a two box fans or some shit from the door with the door open, and then everybody driving by with their, all their other shit, seeing all my glass blowing pipe making <laughs> going on, you know. Yeah, the spot was weird. Our our second Timberline stop ended up shop ended up being right across the street. So it's like half of these buildings are really large, big industrial things, and then there's this little section of about storage unit style buildings, size buildings that we started in. But you know, the construction out here is a little different. We get a lot of like wood framing, wood drywall oh, okay. stuff. I I know Florida has a lot of that cement brick stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's a little easier to cut a hole in the wall, you know, frame a header and a sill in and place a fan and going through brick. I would imagine I've never had to do that. (laughs) Yeah. I wouldn't want to, but I know people that have like in their garage or something like that, you know, just to make a, make a hole in the wall for a fan. Yeah. So you said you guys then moved right across the street. That was like the next expansion, you know, so you guys are slow growing. Yeah. We were sitting there. There was a space that came up right across the street um, the Timberline Studios um, shop, man. I love that shop. It, it was about 20, 2,500 square feet. Nice. Um, it's a little office, a little cold working room, a little gallery. Really old building, you know, pretty janky. And it was a grow. You know, this is all happening. Interesting. Right, right when the medical thing's blown up. So it was a grow prior. And the people had put like a bunch of eight inch holes through the roof. And the one. Lo- landlord said one thing you know it's like don't put any more fucking holes in the roof they all were leaked <laughs> on us when we first got in there oh, man. so we ended up we ended up you know collectively gathering up some bunch of eight inch inline grow fans buying some from the store and actually having to use these old 
holes to ventilate that shop which wasn't ideal, but it worked. And I think for the first year I had a gutter on my hood above me <laughs> um, because of the hole that my fan went out was le- would leak onto the, onto the hood, down it and right onto me. So I made a little gutter that went into a bucket. Oh man. Only um, rain barrel there for you. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> then I showered in the water later, you know, <laughs> That's no, amazing. it wasn't, wasn't quite that heady. Um, <laughs> But yeah, man, I love that shop. I learned a lot in that shop. We we worked there from about 2013 till you know about the beginning of this year. We moved to our new new location. Learned a lot in that shop. You know, it's great great experiences, great memories with yeah. everybody. Yeah, you know, it's amazing though, bro. When you get because I had a I think it was 1,800 square foot was like the biggest space I eventually got, and it, it was like I mean I didn't know what to do with the space. Like it was just like my god <laughs> yeah you know you have all these ideas and you can you know you know you got to grow slow because you can drop ten thousand dollars like in a fucking heartbeat you know but you know you, you go in these spaces and you got to like lay it out and design it and figure it out and make it functional i mean you guys you know you said it had a small office which is awesome the space i had didn't have that and i wanted to build like a small office you know so i could do my podcasting in it and that kind of stuff you know yeah um, you know Back to that, you know, these were all framed out by people that didn't know what they were doing. Some people were living in this unit for a long time, and we would watch it from our old shop. Oh, you know, there was a lot of ongoings in that area that were pretty sketchy. It was like the rooms were framed out in like OSB, um, you know, no ventilation, no heating. Jeez. But it was a room that was dedicated for like a fridge and a, a desk, and you know, it was it was a good beginner beginner spot. Makes you humble. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Where we are now is really. Um, really special you know coming into something yeah man something from uh, yeah so now you guys got this brand new beautiful i mean talking like the view the space the location where you guys are at man like and i felt blessed to be up there and be a part of it you know to to help kind of yeah thanks for coming out dude i I took a welding class that morning you guys were all working um pre-planned way prior but i wish i could have got some working with you but it was good to you know just have a have a little get together with everybody i made it for the end hung out had some beers it was a good time yeah we was clogged, glad to have you out clog the toilets up <laughs> like we literally <laughs> put that place to the fucking edge of whatever could be done with it yeah so we figured that one out um they never turned on there's a little thing that helps the stuff flow into the main sewer and the people who installed it never plugged it in <laughs> so they, they come out and uh check it out and the guy's like oh oh this isn't even plugged in and kind of like plugs it in and was like you should be good <laughs> so the grinder pump that pushes everything out into the into the main sewer wasn't even on yeah the garbage <laughs> so disposal it for the toilet <laughs> yeah it works good now <laughs> hell yeah but yeah we had to test it out it was uh it was good to get work the kinks out like that you know yeah, and I mean it's it's cool to you know to hear the story in the background now and and really get a feeling for it because so many people like I said they want to just get up and fucking run as fast as you can and grow too fast and then fall flat on your face next thing you know you're getting a job somewhere because you're fucking broke you know so it's it's so important and it's and it's I think even more difficult for people to work with each other and the fact that you guys you know as long as you've known each other since you know middle school yeah. you know oh yeah I've known, I've known been smash glass since uh junior high since i moved here we've been homies you know and past one another one of our uh you know in-house artists here we all went to school together and it's never you know i'm not gonna say it's easy working with oh, no, with no, your I get friend, it. friends sometimes but at the same time we know each other well enough to know i think when to lay off or when you know when someone's having a bad day and shit like that you know yeah yeah so I guess in terms of like the business side of things, did you guys like have specific roles that you did to kind of like, you know, one kept the books, one did this and that, or did you guys kind of all have like a, you know, to- it, yeah, at first, like I had a truck, so I got the propane, Ben arranged the oxygen deliveries, Jake took care of the electricity that was like in our first shop, you know, yeah. um, we just divvied up, we divvied it up. And we, we still do, you know, we, we each spearhead certain parts of the business that needs to be taken care of. And then we, you know, we help each other and count counter check everything as well too, just to make sure that everything's right, you know, and we're, we're all on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's the, that's the important part is being able to help each other, but also like delegating specific roles so that, you know, each person's responsible for something specific. So then, you know, and trust them that that's getting taken care of. You know, it's like having a CEO and a vice president, a president for companies and stuff. It's, you know. Yeah, we're st- of course, we're still learning as always, yeah. you know, and uh, we're learning how to communicate and do all this business stuff that was really wasn't wasn't originally part of the plan but you know we're just rolling with it figuring it out making it work you know making it work together and i think that's important being able to you know put all your differences aside and you know make it work and communicate with someone enough to not get pissed and blow up and leave and you know Mm -hmm. it it really helps get get stuff done you know yeah yeah do you have you guys have you guys looked into like taking like class, like business classes together in a sense? Actually, not to, not together, but um, I've contemplated. You know, we've talked about it. Like, man, we should go. They do a lot of stuff at the community college here, business classes, and we have we have talked about it. Yeah, uh, it, I'm sure it wouldn't hurt because uh, you know we're just we're just taking it as it as it comes right now. You know, mm-hmm. figuring it out. Yeah, it's it's good though, man, to, to do that kind of stuff. I mean, like podcasts and stuff are great to listen to to understand it, but to have like someone that gives you a book that says, "Okay, here's how you do bookkeeping," or you know, yeah, or whatever. You, you know, and after I took that welding class not when you were here, and that was really like the intro sucked to sit through, but I learned a lot about just the basics in welding that I didn't know. You know, different styles, different gas, yada yada yada, and like retained it because it was in a classroom setting. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just like your buddy in the garage being like da 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 you know, so I I'd really feel like it would be beneficial yeah, yeah. at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100 percent Because it makes a big difference, man. Especially just to you guys can get all good you know, you've got the glass fundamentals, so you might as well get some some good business fundamentals too in there. Yeah, definitely. Could you could use all the help I can get in that? You know, I I, I am definitely the artist mindset. Yeah, um, yeah, totally. And that's why I want to do this podcast because, like, to me, with the pipe industry, especially, it's so it's such an easy business in terms of like not having a whole lot of overhead, you know, compared to like a big, you know, clothing company or whatever, a grocery store or whatever, you know. And so there's some real basic stuff that you can do, and I'm you know I'm glad we're having this discussion because I talk to a lot of artists on here and. A lot of artists, you know, they want to direct me to their accountant or don't want to talk about the business side of things because either they don't know about it or they just don't really, it's not a priority for them. And it's like, well, you know, you can only be successful for so long if you're not really paying attention to the books, you know, because you got yep. to pay your taxes, yeah. you know, yeah. which you and I were talking yeah, about we, the other day, we, you know, <laughs> fuck. Yeah, we just roll, rolled through <clears throat> our taxes and it wasn't fun. Never fun getting that bill at the end of the year, you know, or mm-hmm. the end of tax season. And it's just like, with the way things have gone, no one, you know, I remember when I first started, it was like hush, hush, cash, cash kind of thing, you know, yeah. uh, pipe making was in that gray area. Now it's moved into the, into the legit side of things. So you got to come correct really to, to do it. I feel like, you know, how do you guys deal with the banking industries? And in, cause I know like a lot of banks, you know, if you're tied to a grow or a, a smoke shop, you know, if it says the name of the smoke shop on there, oh, man, you know, they want yeah, I know some, some of our smoke shops are constantly switching freaking banks over CBD and Kratom or whatever it might be there. You know, they're having a flip flop. Um, we haven't had any issue. Nope. You know, I'm listening to you dude, a little bit. Luckily the Colorado color companies, you know, um, a material company. So that, that one's pretty safe, but my personal one, you know, I, I guess I, it could be any time I could get that, that, you know, that denial from the bank, but it hasn't happened yet. So yeah, keep, keep riding with it, I guess. Yeah, man. So you brought the name up Colorado color company. So let's get, let's get into that talk. So, you know, you guys move, you know, you guys had the space previous to where you're at now. So, and, uh, so at what point in time did you guys come together and start deciding that you want to kind of expand the business in a sense and not just focus on pipe and production, but actually create this material. Man, you know, so it all happened. I think, uh, we started the company in 2016, but prior to that, you know, we'd had a, had a really good trade show and we both did really well. And we were like, man, let's go get a lathe. So, um, borrowed a car trailer, took my truck out to Chicago saw Brandon out at Mouse Machine Works and you know we got a 
Heathway from him, a rebuilt Heathway, and uh, didn't know much about Lays at the time. And we showed up, and you know, we heard six foot bed, yada yada yada. We show up, that's like six foot between the chucks. Yeah, um, it's it's like a nine ten foot lathe. Luckily, we brought a big car trailer, so uh, we we ended up with this big big lathe. Um, it's a great machine. I still love it. I you know run it pretty much daily. Um, but you know, we brought it back, set it up started running it and uh we started doing vac stacks just for ourselves you know and then you know, the blade lathe was so big that uh we started full of sticks we got a really good technique for doing it but you know we're still refining that technique to this day yeah. but you know we had a good technique and all of a sudden we had bins and bins and bins of vac stack tubing that like i personally couldn't even work through unless i wanted to make like you know rainbow pattern for the next two years right. we just started selling it, selling it around town selling it to the people in our shop um in about 2015 you know we just had excess of material <clears throat> and then uh you know yeah you know smash put some uh it was like some dub- double layered cool uv stringer um stuff he put it up on the big cartel and sold it and you know we just kind of had this thought like man we got bins of material the ability to make this stuff you know let's start a tubing company and so we started colorado color company in 2016 nice so i guess early on with the back stacking because i know myself personally like when the back stack i I was doing like stick stacks you know type of stuff forever before like the the vacuum was incorporated into it you know using a wood mandrel or whatever for the core in a sense just to hold all my shit together and then I started seeing the back stack and stuff coming up, and I'm like, man, this makes more sense because not only are you adding more clear and making this shit go further, but you're also sucking out the air with the vacuum and getting all the air bubbles out of it. You're getting more material in the long run for things. So is that kind of like for you guys? Was it just kind of? Uh, you know, I I I came into glass where you know back stack was. Uh, I didn't really get into the stick stack. Back stack was like the standard kind of when we were getting into it. Yeah. You know, I did I did some like you know drawing lines, stretching the tubing out, some stuff like that. But uh, as soon as we saw vac stack, it was like you know hooked up the shop back to you know a little fifty by five outer diameter <laughs> vac stack, and we we're pulling little fifty by five stacks down. And then we had bumped it up to you know outside seventy five by five. We were doing those by hand for our personal stuff, half sticks. Jeez. Pretty, pretty hot, you know, pretty hot process, yeah. you know, get, get your car hearts smoking. Yeah. Um, and, and then that, that was part of the reason of buying a lathe, you know, it's like, man, fuck holding these things. Let, let's go get a lathe. We did really good at that trade show, you know? Yeah. So, so that's kind of where that came from, I guess. Hell yeah. So, so then as you start to grow this company and you're creating all this tubing, did you start to find like your background in art and the painting and the color kind of helped you to figure out specific patterning that you guys were using or was it just kind of fucking around and experimenting? No, yeah, there's definitely like, um, how would you say it? Set layouts that we like to use that, you know, mm-hmm. we personally feel, feel look good. 50 fifties, especially, you know, 50, yeah. 50 patterns. So, um, there's cert- certain stuff we definitely uh, focus yeah. on that we, we personally like the aesthetic of, you know, with like our motto is, you know, for artists, by artists. So we make this at the end of the day for ourselves and for a production line too, you know, so we want it to look good for our, our stuff too. So, yeah. And, know. Then, and then figuring out like the certain certain colors that work and because there's nothing worse dude than pulling down like a tube of, with some like unobtainium and shit and then just like that line <laughs> cracks you know what i mean oh man yeah or black <laughs> unobtainium i love that color but you cannot case it <laughs> yeah, exactly um learn, learn you know you learn those the hard way and we still you know any new color that drops um We'll test, we'll do a full stack of, we'll buy some of it, you know, fuck with it, see how it stacks, see how it works in general, you know, mm-hmm. just, just for ourselves as artists, you never know what kind of application you might run across, you know, Yeah, yeah. whether, whether it's encased or, you know, raw or whatever it might be. So 
Yeah. It's fun with the color company. We usually get get all the new colors and fuck with them a little bit just to see where they would fit in well. Yeah, and that was kind of my thought too, you know, because certain colors react better when they're exposed to the, the flame, the chemistry, compared to if it's got a sleeve over it, there's no exposure whatsoever. You know, like amber purple, for instance, you know. So there's, you know, there's there's certain things out there, you know, in terms of back stacking, like doing a, a ball of, you know, tubulation aspect or a quill potting tends to, to work a little better with certain colors. Did you guys find too, like, you know, you're saying the experimentation of things, like, was that part of, part of the deal too for you guys? Oh yeah. Um, always, ex- we're still experimenting, experimenting with new colors and, uh, old colors, you know? Yeah. Um, color, you know, I guess with my drawing now too, that's opened up a whole nother window into like, uh, you know, all these colors I couldn't use before a little off subject here, but like spring purple and guacamole and like stuff like that, that I've had that I didn't know was bad when I was young, not bad, but I didn't know it was hard to work. I would just go to Glasscraft in Denver and buy what I thought was cool on unknowing what was workable and what was hard. But now with, you know, (laughs) some years under my belt and a little more, uh, color knowledge, been able to work some of these harder to work colors. You are, and it's been fun, dude. It's like colors that you are like, oh, I love that color, but can't work it. What the fuck? Yeah, interesting. I didn't think about that too, because if you're trying to pull a stack down and a couple of those colors that are like really stiff aren't going to pull down the same as what else is, you know, being, you know, mixed oh, to yeah. it, you know, in a sense. Yeah, you know, we try to keep our back stacks pretty even. Um, we saw, you know, you get some colors that, you know, the viscosities are different and one side is really soft and like one side is really hard. Uh, like, you know, a fade to clear would be the best example of a off, you know, lopsided back stack. Yeah. But, um, you know, we try to, we, we test and we work all this stuff into pieces. And so we will cut out the really, really hard to work ones unless they're like, epically visually cool you know mm-hmm. so we we try to keep it workable for ourselves and for other people are you finding too because i know like certain colors you know you go do a vac stack and it still leaves like the ridge like you can still tell it was a vac stack instead of being like a smooth transition of color i mean is that something that issue wise you guys are you either want that effect or you don't want that effect like is there like a certain opinion you guys have like in terms of also from feedback too from your customers i'm sure you guys get a ton of feedback like the man this shit like, fucking uh, sucks or this shit's amazing you know yeah um are you talking like solid color stacks yeah 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 um you know it's a back stack that's just the nature of the back stack it's gonna be liney even if you throw stringers in there it's liney mm-hmm. um we just we pull a rainbow just to go with everything you know of the solid color stuff and then you know new hype stuff to test it we'll just pull a solid stack of it see how it works um it's definitely been a lot le- less popular. Um, the solid stuff. People are into the blowouts and the you know coil pots and the sleeving all that stuff. Which you know every different colors have different applications. Right. You know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the lininess of a of a solid back stack is just there's no getting away with it yeah, without yeah. it. You know, it's it's just going to be there. There's some that are really really hard to tell. You know, mm-hmm. um, like blacks. I, I've used black for a long time. Black back stacks are great. Really hard to see the lines. Um, you know, that was one of the first hard to work colors that I really liked. The back stacked well. Um, I don't know it's really up to up to the artists, up to the market they're selling it in. You know mm-hmm. what what they can get for their stuff, their experience level, whether or not they want to use the solid stuff. You know we have been selling a lot more of the classic alternating line, alternating color pattern stuff lately, and that you know that's probably the the true good nature of the back stack is to get that pattern by alternating the colors like that, you know? Right. Right. I mean, like for me personally, like, you know, even with my brother too, and he's had the kind of the same opinion is like, I like pulling a, like I just did the other day, I pulled a, a vac. I'm, I don't even know what the hell it's a purple CFL. It's like the Chinese purple amethyst, but it's a, a North star version. And you know, it's 
as when I pulled it down, there were still. I don't know. I'm I'm almost positive it's because the glass was still a little dirty. Like I cleaned the shit out of everything. Oh man, you yeah, I mean? you gotta be you gotta be sterile. Gloves, yeah, totally. And ISO the whole nine. We we have a really uh, sterile process. Dirt will fuck a back stack up. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Finger, and that's, I was kind of wondering if that was whatever. what the issue was. But I know certain colors that still will do that naturally, just just because of the nature of the color. You know, if you can't, if you blow it out thin, it looks like it's all one buttery, smooth piece of colored tubing. But then when you like, like a, you can do a wigwag pattern, and if you hold it up to the light, you can see that wigwag pattern in the piece, even though it looks yeah. tra- completely translucent. And for me the, personally, the ghost wigwag. Yeah, dude, I love that. <laughs> some shit. people trip on that. I, there's some people that use our tubing and did full ghost wigwag pieces. You know. Yeah. I love it. Do you guys also do like double, like a double clear? Because like for instance, I know back in the day uh, when Chris Carlson, he's when he we, but when he used to go by LA Glass, like this is fucking fifteen years ago, and he was doing like he was one of the first people I saw take a Rasta wig, like a Rasta you know, stack, and then sleeve that again to water it down even more so, so that the you know the Crayola colors were like translucent. And mm. so I looked fucking badass, and I and so I started doing that myself. I'm like, damn, this makes sense, so, you know, to make it makes your color go further, but also gives it it can take a cadmium color and make it a, a translucent, you know, in a sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess just cutting it, cutting it down, cutting it down. Yeah, so have you guys you know, experimented with that? No, um, but with with glass and the material, anything, you know, art's infinite. You could you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. And get these aesthetics you're looking for, you know, if you want watered down look and it goes well with what you're trying to accomplish, you know, there's like infinite possibilities. Yeah, I think that's the one thing with glass, man, being an artist. When I have customers that work, they're like, oh, just be an artist, have fun. I'm like, I need some fucking parameters, please. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. um, Yeah, you're talking when like someone asks you for like a custom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I usually ask for like basic color. I don't do a lot of customs. I'll do them for my friends and stuff like that. Or if someone's willing to pay, you know, there's an upcharge I've on my custom stuff. If if you want it, you're actually going to pay more in case it breaks. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like if it's something I'm constantly making, I'm pretty efficient at it. If it's something out of the norm, I'm probably going to fuck it up once. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, I ask for you know basic colors. And to kind of keep it in my style. And this is very rare that I ever do any custom work anymore. Yeah, yeah. Same um, I just made a set of wine glasses for my buddy's anniversary, though, and it was really fun. Um, I, I love making cups. Um, learned from uh, a good buddy, Kerry Hollenberg, um, C. Martin Glass. Gave me some cup cup demos classes early on. And, uh, you know, he took classes from all the old Italian guys. So, man, there's... There's nothing like nailing a good, good uh, cup. Oh, tell <laughs> glass, me about it. Wine glass. Yeah, dude, and you can get that ring out of it. Cause like I used to make wine glasses, and my, my Dave Walker over at Zen, he would take, oh, my, yeah. he'd take my cup and he'd flick it, and he's like, "Hear that thud?" Now listen to my cup, and then you get that ring, and I'm like, "Ah, makes total sense." Cause mine were too thick and they were chunky, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's really like a delicate, um delicate thing that's nail yeah. one very skilled and I, I like i like it when i nail one i feel really good it's yeah. just like a drawing that's something i've spent years trying to perfect you know and they don't all come out perfect you know but when you get that one that's got the perfect lip nice foot you know it's just like it feels good and then you got to make a set <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh man so usually how i do that is i'll make you know twice as many tops and feet as i need and then i'll arrange them mm-hmm. Um, so that, you know, if someone asks me for, gl- for glasses that comes into play, it's like, I got to make twice as many tops unless you're okay with a little variance, you know, yep. but if they want, if they're okay with a little variance, which people usually are, it makes it look more handmade too. But, yep. you know, if you really want like a set, it's, you got to make more, more than just, uh, the amount you're shooting for. <laughs> Yeah, it's so true, dude. I completely agree. I've had to do that over the years, just making make ten cups and only two are the ones that you want to actually use for a set. Yeah, and you can always, you know, that the extra ones that are a little different always make like a great you stick a foot on it, give it to someone for their birthday, what you know, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Um there's not like it's unusable. It's <laughs> it's there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, it, it, 
Yeah, completely, man. And I wouldn't even call them seconds either. You know, they're still first quality. If it, you know, if it looks good, it's even oh, and yeah. consistent. You know, it's what I like about them. It's fun. Yeah. Hell yeah. So, so do you guys have like uh, visions for the future with the studio space? Um, you know, we're we're gonna try to do some classes and stuff. Um, we're just figuring out the logistics of that at the moment. Yeah. Uh, you know, insurance waivers. It's all crazy business stuff that is no fun. To do. But we're working on it. You know, hopefully we'll get some classes rolling. We got a lot of people from the college here wanting to take one oh one classes. We built a couple extra spaces, maybe get some new faces in the shop and just continue to, you know, work with glass, expand. Um, you know, we're not just solely going to stick to back stacks either. We have some plans of doing some other styles of things, and we have the power and the space for it now. So we'll see. It, you know, we're just kind of letting it happen at the at the moment and uh, letting things fall into place. Sometimes it all takes time, you know. And sometimes you just can't force those dreams you have right into action. You know. Yeah, yeah. You got you got to work hard and uh, just kind of let it let it take take shape and let it happen you know yeah man i agree dude and you know like in terms of my my influences and in, in my most of my life as i've from a child on like my two biggest influences walt disney and vince mcmahon and walt for the living out your dreams and you know starting off with nothing to create something you know and sacrificing and all that kind of stuff but yeah, for, walt, walt disney is a crazy story of that yeah man. dude right but like with vince mcmahon and and he's kind of the same kind of thing he didn't go rags to riches but still taking this this thing and then turning it into a business that tells a story and you know i watch these i've been watching wrestling since i was in like fifth grade so fucking going on 35 years almost now <laughs> nice die hard oh yeah dude like totally like wrestlemania was this past weekend like i wasn't missing it you know kind of thing but you know character development and these wrestlers it might take them like kofi kingston's a wrestler i've been watching forever he's 11 years been in, in professional wrestling and he just now had an opportunity to go for the championship belt and it was a complete fluke in a sense for him to have this opportunity because the guy that was supposed to be in his place had gotten injured. So they went to him to say, hey, man, why don't you come in and, you know, be a, be a part of this, this story now in a sense. And then one thing led to another. But it took him 11 years of humping and busting his ass, having an amazing fucking attitude the entire time, being humble. That's what it takes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what it takes. Totally. It's just all about being dedicated. You know, you can't jump around and be flip-flopping and blah, blah, blah. You got to just like... Here's where I am now. Here's my goals. It might take me 20 years to get there. I mean, for myself, I'm living out my dreams on a daily basis. And then every time I go there to work, I'm, I, it's still surreal for me after being there for seven years, you know, but ever since I was a that's child, good, dude, you know? that, make, that makes your life happy. <laughs> oh yeah, totally, bro. Absolutely. And that's what it's all about. You know, it's like finding the dream and then like, okay, what do I need to do to get to that point? You know, listen, listen to the whispers in the winds and look for doors opening and that kind of stuff, but also having the patience and the know-how it's just to have the patience just to be like it's that whole yeah, you know, story you know yeah yeah when me and ben first started this we had a, a pretty serious conversation about a 10-year plan you know mm -hmm. and uh you know um you know looking at it now thinking of it um we're way ahead of what we really wanted to accomplish and it's you know i'm proud of that i'm proud of doing it with one of my best friends um you know, our 10 year plan was pretty, pretty basic, but it was a goal to shoot for in a, you know, a okay amount of time. And we've been working hard at it and I feel like we've surpassed it. You know, it's something to be proud of. I'm, I'm stoked, stoked on it. Stoked to where I am, dude. Bro, I'm, pr I'm proud of you guys. And I've just barely know you, yeah, you. <laughs> but I was like, you know, <laughs> but still, you know, it's like, you know, I feel like I've known you guys for a long time. Like when I came to that, yeah, the dude. shop and met you guys, it was like, I've known you all forever. And I don't know if my brother was a part of that whole thing, but you know, just, yeah, yeah. We're, you know. We worked with Jared for a year. Solid, you know, we became very good friends with Florida. Um, he's still, he's still in the posse, you know, Yeah. he's in his garage now grinding. We moved a little North. So, uh, didn't come with us but we're you know we still converse and chat about art all kinds of stuff you yeah, know yeah yeah it's amazing man and you guys are still you know you're humble about stuff and you know you're about opening your doors and all the stuff that you guys have been doing since day one you're still doing and i think that's what really separates you what you guys are doing compared to like some cor corporate entity that's like got a bunch of chicks hanging out with them and trying to sell the sex side of things to make themselves blow up you know like all this other crazy shit you see on social media these days 
and you guys are just keeping it real and humble, man. So, you know, more power to you. Hey, thank you. Yeah, social media is a trip, you know. Um, you can do crazy shit and get attention. Um, I don't know. There's a million ways to get attention. Making it last is the trick, I think, which I still haven't figured out. <laughs> um, I'm just I'm just letting the thing build, you know. Just trying, just trying to move slow, move precise, make make good work, be honest, you know, do yeah. the thing right. Yeah, in all realities, dude, ten years, you guys like just got your foot in the door, really, you know, at this point. Yeah, yeah, I think you know it was all started around 2010, so we're only at about nine years right now. But it's been an everyday lifestyle, you know. Yeah, we're in here on the weekends, you know. It's like uh, it became a lifestyle really quick. Yeah, more than a yeah. job right yeah exactly lifestyle is exactly it completely I agree 100 percent. but also you know having family and stuff now and being a dad so you understand too how important the family time is because man like my daughter's 20 now and it's amazing is it shit? oh yeah she came out with you that's a trip yeah you gotta you've been you've been through it <laughs> i'm yeah. still fresh. yeah 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 amazing. the kid the kid totally changed my my lifestyle you know we were going to shows and like since i was you know a young kid we you know music scene heavily every weekend you know um it, i still go see show or, uh, and we'll take the kid to the mellower shows and it's been good you know it's been a fun life change and uh man my little daughter just fucking melts melts my heart dude she's a some, something about that <laughs> oh yeah bro having a having a girl is a whole different thing for sure yeah, definitely. It's awesome. Definitely. She's she's rad. We went fishing the other day. She's catching fish. She's just like almost three. So she's getting real interactive, being able to go out, do fun things, you know. So too cool. It, it's been cool. It's it's changed my motive it's changed my motivation, you know, though. Um I definitely make less art, which uh isn't necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's just part of life. I need to provide for my family. So, um, focus a lot more on production and, you know, the Colorado color company stuff. And then I sneak my art in when I can now, but you know, my wife and happy little baby there. I love, you know, so it just life changes, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. You can, you can recognize that man. Cause I know myself at, at my, you know, early twenties getting into glass. I mean, I guess, you know, I started at 23 now. So, I was pretty immature about everything for a long time, you know, and still trying to run a business and work at shit, but I'd kind of let a lot of things outside of the glass just go fizzle away. And because I wasn't, wasn't focusing and taking the time off to dedicate, you know, to that, I was just like, go, 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 go. And that shit will kill you. It, feel, <laughs> it feels like that for me a lot. I'm not, oh, yeah. no, not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. Like, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going constantly. I have a full plate it, for sure. Um, it, you know, it's stressful. It is, um, wearing and tiring, but that is life, you know? Yeah. And having the support though, like having, you know, your wife understanding, I mean, you know, she, she got, in a sense, you guys, you know, under, you know, knowing your all story and having hung out with you guys, you know, all the couples and y'all, I mean, have known each other. All of you guys have known each other since early on. So it's, it's kind of fun to see this whole, yeah. you know, yeah, I've been with, friends. My, with my wife, uh, over a decade now and we we just got married a couple years back but we were together before that for at least a decade you know so we know each other we, we know each other really well yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yeah. but she's the she's the one for me and uh we went it was really you know it was never really about a traditional wedding i always thought you know if you love someone you should just be able to tell them you know mm -hmm. but we had a traditional wedding and it was so fucking fun i'm not gonna lie it was one of the best days of my life um, I was really nervous up leading up to it, but after it was all said and done, very cool experience. Hell yeah. Yeah, man, that's the best. Yeah. Yeah. Um, leading up to it, though, I was sweating. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. Yeah, it's, but it's funny, yeah. man. Once you make that, like, like, it's like, oh, I got a commitment, but it's like, I've been committed for 10 years, so what's the fucking difference? You know, we're just signing papers, having a party. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, the party was really, really fun, actually. Yeah. That's really the fun. That's the best all the part families got together, all the friends got together, and mm. we just had a good old fashioned party. It was good. I like to get married once there's... a year just to have that party. <laughs> yeah, there's there's something about that wedding vibe too, where like if there 
it would be hard to have a bad one. I've never been to a wedding where like, even if shit goes wrong, Mm -hmm. it's a wedding. So everybody's still like making the best of it. And there's just this like love vibe going around where, yeah, we could have, we could have a fake one every year. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Be awesome. Let me know next time so I can be there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Hopefully there won't be a next time. Maybe we'll do like the renew your vows kind of shit or something. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Well, I think that'd be a good spot, spot for us to uh, take a quick break and thank some sponsors, and then we'll come back, and it'll be time for us to crash a kiln. Awesome. Sounds good, brother. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Since its inception, the focus of The Flow has been to provide a bond among members of the lamp working community. In every issue, you can enjoy great content with the hottest artists and cutting-edge techniques using the latest industry products. These features, along with the continuation of our Women in Glass edition, Glass Craft Immersion Artist Awards, inspiring gallery showcases, dynamic general interest articles, as well as health and safety information, make The Flow the leading international lampworking journal. For more information or to subscribe to The Flow, go to theflowmagazine.com. That's theflowmagazine.com. All right, man, we're back. So uh, crashing the kill round consists of uh, seven questions. Sure, or you if you want to give me a 30 to 60 second answer, or you can expound upon them as well, as we always tend to do here. And uh, the first question I would like to ask is if there's any living glass artists that you like to collab with and work with and have not yet, and uh, who is it and why? Oh, man. Um, you know, we talked about WJC. Um, that dude, just his drawing ability and his technical stuff, would love to not even collab with him to see his process, but, um, you know, any of the big drawing guys, punny, cold drink, I would love, love to be able to hang out with those guys. Banjo. He's sorry. This is going on more than just one. It's cool. Ban- Banjo's on the total other end of doing these grand builds with really, you know, and lots of embellishments off a of functional center. You same deal. You has got that mashup. So, you know, um for that question i would say you because uh we missed it out we missed out on it while you were out here so um beyond all those guys and their cool technical abilities i would have liked to got one in with you while you were here yeah dude i'm actually already making plans to head back out there maybe maybe we can get one in i got that little frog you made me for my birthday up on my mantle oh nice i was actually just looking at looking at it the other day so thank you for that birthday present too, yeah, by the way yeah it was fun to get to make that like be like the first thing i made in the studio to kind of break it in for you guys and i had to give it to yeah you. yeah yeah it's very meaningful awesome this could be a next hard... time you come out next time you come out we'll get one in <laughs> yeah absolutely I, I completely agree and uh this could probably be a hard question for you but uh what are your top five favorite colors in glass oh man you know I said this earlier, but it's like those hard colors that eluded me in my early on career, like spring purple, guacamole, um, you know, that tell magenta is really hot. Any of that new molten aura stuff they're putting out, it's pretty vibrant and yeah. cool. Diff- a little different from the palette I've seen in a while, Siberia. And then the blizzards too, um, really workable colors. They look all stony and weird, but I've been, uh, I've been digging the blizzards. They're expensive as fuck, though. I couldn't believe when I went out there and saw the prices on because I hadn't actually seen them online yet. But I was like, "Oh my god!" Yeah, it's all, all Trotman stuff is uh, a little more pricey usually. Yeah, but it's, he, it's worth it though. I think, and you know, in the end, yeah, it does. he makes great color. To me, it's like the I guess, it's like a fine small batch whiskey or something like that. You know? Yeah, I guess they're they're merging with North Star or something. I don't know the details, but <clears throat> we'll see how that all plays out. I guess maybe the maybe the color costs will come down on those colors. Yeah. Be nice because I know, like, when the Illuminati came out and Abe was all about keeping that shit cheap, or at least not, I shouldn't say cheap, but affordable, you know, for yeah. us, you know, even though it was like super hype. It's always good to see, yeah, yeah. North Star has that good uh color program, yeah. Uh, number three is what is your worst injury in the studio, man? You know, nothing substantial. I've always hurt myself more skateboarding, <laughs> snowboarding, um. <laughs> then coming into the shop and not being able to work, but you know, cuts, burns, fucking shit will put you out for a couple of days while your hands heal. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, the hot glass down the shirt every once in a while or stick to the neck, but 
Um, you know, I got all my digits, all my eyes. Um, I'm going to knock on some wood. Yeah, dude, I'm, I was about to say, I'm doing the same thing here, my friend. <laughs> uh, nothing crazy, you know. I've opened my hand up pretty good where it's just gushing blood, and yeah. yada, 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 but never any stitches yet. <laughs> From, I don't know. I'm going to keep knocking on yeah. wood. Let's change, <laughs> let's change the subject. <laughs> Uh, when you're in the studio, do you listen to the radio, watch TV, or do both? Oh, man, I'm uh, music all day. Um, there's something about music that just puts me in the right headspace to create art, you know? Yeah. Um, hip-hop, jam bands, fucking bluegrass, whatever it might be. Man, if there's some weird fucking country on the radio, I'll be tapping my foot, bobbing my head. I don't even know if it matters what kind of music is on. Just the it's on. <laughs> Hell yeah. I think that's the one nice thing with the Pandoras and stuff out there nowadays is to be able to not get burnt out. On, cause, you know, because I had like the same five CDs I listened to every day for fucking oh. a decade. You know, it's like, God, I'm over this shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and then Pandora started really jamming out some stuff and it made a huge difference. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've been doing a lot of, you know, discographies um, through Spotify. Um, you know, just listening to artists I like from their first album, excuse their last. Hmm. Oh, excuse me. Fascinating. And it's it's cool to see, uh, you know, artist progression like that, like we've kind of talked about mine today, which I rarely do in this uh, magnitude. But it's cool to hear someone's first album to their current work, you know. So I've been doing a lot of that on Spotify, like choosing an artist and listening to every one of their albums through in sequence. Do you find as much as you appreciate that, though, that a lot of times you prefer their older shit? Um, you know, one of the first ones I did was Wiz Khalifa, and I wasn't like a giant Wiz fan because he was so poppy. Mm-hmm. Uh, not poppy, he was just mainstream, you know? But one of my friends was like, you need to check this out, you know? And, man, his first shit is so hot, like uh, Pittsburgh Sound, um, man just some old heat you know yeah. um so it gave me it gave me appreciation of where he came from and appreciation for his music now and you know it's hard sometimes you make assessments and i lost you there it's You're yeah it's like uh yeah sometimes you make judgments and assessments on like people and music or whatever it might be without fully knowing the background or what you know the mm-hmm. whole story so i feel it's good to be open-minded and uh until you really know you don't like something or something's wrong or whatever it might be just keep an open mind yeah i agree it's it's interesting to say that i was, I was uh i follow gary vanderchuk on the instagrams and stuff and i was watching one of his little interviews the other day and he had a i don't know who the hip-hop artist was but they were talking about his creation process and his newer stuff he's been putting out and trying to make fresh music but also still stick to his roots because he got so big he was finding that the bigger he got the further away from his roots he had gotten you know getting to, into more of a modern hip-hop that, quote that happens you want to you want to stay current with what what's paying and what's what people are listening to you know so right. it might draw you away from your original inspiration well he said he, he's like the way i did it was I, he went back to his roots i mean literally physically took himself back to where he grew up in la and like hung out in the streets with the guys he used to hang out with and was like part of the culture again. You know, people drive by and getting shot at and shit. And it was like, it made him realize that he needed to have that influence back in his life to really dig deep down and really find what he was looking for in his music. And it was interesting to, you know, hearing that kind of stuff, even if it's just like go drive through an old neighborhood that used to live in, you know, might, might spark an interest or like you're saying with your graffiti, you know, like, yeah, you know, my dad, my dad's from the LA Valley and then my brother lived there for a long time. So growing up, I would go back actually to the Valley and, uh, you know, they would just let me go skateboard and uh, cruise around, met the whole CBS crew, just painting a wall one day. And I was like, some, you know, 15 year old kid cruising around, backpack full of spray paint, painting a skateboard and a little black book. And like, these are like graffiti legends I looked up to. And they're sitting there painting a wall, you know, doing their thing. And they were totally open. It was like Atlas and Deuce and like, just like dudes I was looking up to. And they were so nice. They like took me in, let me kick it all day, you know, we're right. real people. And, um, uh, you know, it was, I thought about that the other day when I was kind of thinking about all this, I was like, man, that was a cool, that was cool. That, you know, yeah. Interesting. Cool. Ex- cool experience in LA there. Hell yeah. So if uh, you could describe the sound of glass cracking in one word, whether the actual sound it creates or an uh, emotional sensation it gives you in your soul, what, what would that be? 
Oh man, so I, it's pretty bone chilling when you hear that tink, mm-hmm. um, or you feel it. Some you know you can feel it through the handle sometimes. Yeah. Um, I would say bone chilling. Hell yeah! You get I don't know you you get this weird feeling through your whole body <laughs> like it's like your sixth sense like Ugh. yeah. <laughs> the worst is when you have like a bunch of bridges on and shit and you hear it and you're killing. It's like man, I hope that Ooh, was a bridge. Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Bridges will go. Um, yeah, that's always a sketchy one because sometimes you don't know where it is and then you're like, is it in the piece? Is it in the bridge? And you know, you have that like little time to freak out mentally while you're locating the mm-hmm. problem. <laughs> I had one pop off on me yesterday. Like I want to do my characters now. I, I, I used to not use bridges at all on anything in home or at work. And I started really using them a lot more at, at, at work with my characters. Like, cause I, like, you know, we'll make a body and then I attach the head. So they really get the head on and get the I angle it the way I want it, and then I bridge it, and then I clean this shit all up. And I was making my little Remy yesterday, and mid, the bridge like popped off on him, like mid working on the piece, and I was just like, it, it made a sound because they both popped at the same time. You know, it was just, it was the craziest <laughs> shit I'd seen. I'd never experienced that. It was like a spring. Just, I made sure it didn't like hit anybody too. You know, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Sometimes you know that stuff will build up stress too. If, if that little like six mil brace is holding a lot of weight. And it like sets up maybe, you know, from like gravity holding one end down and you're putting a little stress on your brace mm-hmm. and everything solidifies. Um, when that brace goes, it can fling some shit, you know, yeah, I always, I always try, you know, if I have multiple connections, um, including the brace, I'll, I'll get them all melted in really well. And then I'll go back and build an even heat base into each one. So it kind of evens out that stress that may be held against the separate points being attached to the body of the piece yeah it makes sense i can see that for sure i have to start doing yeah that. you just yeah you just kind of even everything out right before you put it back you know it yeah. seems to help with uh you know if you're putting a disc on and it's got two connections you know or something like that yeah, yeah. cool good tip there yeah, yeah. Let's see what else here I guess what I think it's only six questions, man. There's, I feel like I have a question in here that I keep forgetting to ask, and I don't I don't know what it is. But the last one I know is uh, what are your top five favorite tools, and that does not include your torch or your glasses or your kiln. Um, you know I'm gonna go with my Griffin jacks. I I love those things. Jacks and a bench roller, great setup. Um, you know we were all making them out of tweezers. Mm-hmm. Um, are they small jacks or the, the, the actual like, no, they're like, they're reasonably sized jacks. They're not like soft glass, maybe, you know, under a foot. Okay. Griffin, Griffin tool, but Griffin makes them great, great jacks. They're about a hundred bucks. Nice. Um, we were making them out of tweezers, bending, bending the tweezer over and then grinding it into the shape. Um, I think it was something salt was showing people I want to say. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. He's known for that tech. Um, but my Griffin jacks and then, you know, a roller has been great. Um, my Jim Moore cup shears and my dime shears, other great tools there. The cup shears are, um, more from the soft glass world, but they're the small size. Okay. Yep. Um, so I, I love those things, man. I'll clean up a little nib on a blow tube before I, you know, go to flare it. It's like, I use those things just to take off, you know, a tiny little blib of glass or a large amount, you know? Definitely a tool I use a lot. Um, Fire kiss cutting wheels. Um, you know that one? Uh, I have seen it before. I've never used them, but I like for cutting tubing and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Your brother actually turned me on to that one. Yeah. Um, man, I can't ride without that now. I was using a necking tool for everything. I have like a necking tool on my GTT at the time, mm-hmm. um, brass or something. But that fire. That fire kiss cutting wheel totally changed uh, the, my cutting abilities for, uh, you know, laying a score in some glass and snapping it. Yeah, so you do like a score and then you add a little bead of hot glass to it to get it to run? N- right. No, no, you do it hot. Oh, um, okay. So it's it's two wheels that um, are parallel right. and they roll together, kind of like a necking tool. It makes a little necking tool down in there. Yep. Um, so, you know, you take a little laser beam flame make a hot spot and you roll it in the wheels and it leaves a crease and then you just wiggle snap it yep exactly great tool um 
you know, tungsten pick, one of my all time favorites. I have all these shaping tools for, um, you know, drawing, drawing the outline and doing, doing the drawings. I have all these little like flathead yada, yada, yadas. Mm -hmm. 99% of the time I'm just using a sharpened tungsten pick, no handle about six inches long. And then the tungsten and tweezers as well have been another thing I just added that I really have been enjoying. They like the bent neck styles. Yep, yeah, bent yeah. neck tungsten tweezers all day, and yeah, not the dude, cheap are... ones. I I bought the cheap ones because I couldn't get. I broke my nice ones. Bought the cheap ones, and what happens is when you squeeze them together too far, they actually meet, and then the tungstens open up a little bit. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, but the I would recommend the you know the high dollar tungsten tweezers are really nice. They're yeah. less shocky, more delicate applications, you know. Yeah, they're great for opening up tubing and all kind of small holes and all kind of. Yeah, shit. I love them. Yeah, so I guess those those have been uh, my tools lately, and the, the lathe, of course. You know? Yeah, <laughs> can't can't beat that one. I was going to ask you about that with your cups. Are you are you doing your cups on a bench, or are you doing them on a on a on a lathe? Um, you know, I do the tops on the lathe now. Okay. Um, do them on. 65 by 32 and then i flame cut the, the opening but the foot i do by hand i spin the feet out by hand because cool. i feel like that looks looks best um i can make the cups on the bench just not as efficiently <laughs> yeah it makes sense um, that, that's how i learned you know but the, the cup top on the lathe is definitely you just get that machine pristine look you know yeah yeah just on a complete... more cons oh go on I'm sorry. I, was, I thought you were, I thought you were done. So I, I was just going to say it's, it's more consistent than by hand. Yeah, it makes sense. But, man, anybody who can make that by hand, I have the utmost respect for it because that's a delicate maneuver. Well, that's what I was kind of curious about because going – for me personally, like I've worked on a lathe a little bit and not being able to change the pitch – really at all you know you're, i'm so used to my whole body's the lathe you know in a sense when i'm on my torch. <laughs> yeah so for me i got i was actually getting bored just kind of sitting there and rolling it and heating it and blowing it and paddling and shit and do you find like when you're you started to go to the lathe that you were i don't know it uh, did well, you, how, you what, broke up right there can you repeat that question yeah yeah i was saying like when you went from the torch to the lathe was there did you find like that transition was difficult at first for you or was it a little oh, more yeah. natural oh man at first yeah you're like you know, you're so used to shifting your gravity, like you said, side to side and like using gravity that it is, uh, there's definitely a learning curve there. But now that I know, know the ins and out of the lathe, um, you know, it has, it has its place yeah. and it has its, you know, like I wouldn't do a foot on the lathe because it looks so machined. Um, it, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, uh, it's a tool for certain things if you want a certain aesthetic and certain looks, you know. Yeah, it makes sense. Just like just like torches, you know. I recently got a Herbie in the past year, and work on a lot of GTPs, and they're just different tools, you know. Man. And they're I use I use yeah. them for different things. That Herbie, bro, I, I worked on my brothers for the first time ever using one, and it was to me the most intuitive torch I've ever been on before. Like I felt like it was part of my hands. It was yeah. it was weird as shit, and I and I noticed like. You can get a lot of heat out of it, but like, you can't at the same time. It's it's different. But man, I love. Yeah, that. you know, it's it's different. There's certain things I like to do on my Mirage, or you know, we got a couple other GTTs in the shop. Um, the you know, there's certain things I like to do on the GTT, and certain things I like to do on the Herbie. They just each have their own characteristics that play into certain you know maneuvers. Mm -hmm better so it's it's nice to have both <laughs> yeah yeah um i agree expensive little quiver of tools but um good to have yeah that's yeah, good to invest the money then it saves you on uh, having to pay tax taxes and stuff <laughs> i know oh, i was <laughs> just thinking that i was just thinking that looking at the money i got to pay in the other day i was like man i should have bought another torch <laughs> <laughs> awesome dude well, it was a fucking pleasure talking to you man and didn't uh, oh, you know, always you know getting always. to know you more and it's interesting. This this is my first real interview doing because I I haven't smoked now for, God, I think about a month now. So like, but just just my head chemistry and my clarity and my thoughts and stuff. I really feel like I don't know if it's just because it's you too and I'm super comfortable talking to you. But I definitely feel like for myself, I was able to pull out a lot of a lot of questions and stuff that to to really feed the audience. So 
Well, yeah, yeah, I'm glad we got to get to know each other. I've never really done anything like this, too, you cool. know. So um, getting to know you a little prior, I really felt like helped help me be able to talk a little bit bit more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was the, the, pre, the pre-show jitters. I, I get them, too, myself, even still after well, 212 that, episodes. That's, that, that's good to know that it never goes away. Yeah. I think <laughs> it's that whole thing that, you know, if you love what you do, there's always that kind of pre-show, pre-whatever anxiety that you oh, get. Yeah. I mean, you hear about fucking people on stage that throw up before they go on stage, you know? It's like... Cool. Man, yeah, I still get jittery before I go to like a big like, show at like Red Rocks or something. You get those like butterflies in your tummy, you yeah. know. It's like you're going in on a big adventure, yeah, exactly. doing doing something out of your normal day. Yeah, absolutely. Hell but yeah, yeah dude. dude! Thanks for thanks for making this comfortable and it, you know it's good chat. I yeah, thoroughly yeah. enjoyed it. Likewise, man. Go ahead and hang on after I do our little outro. But before that, if you want to uh, tell us where we can find you and also the Colorado Color Company out there in cyberspace, and then a little parting piece of advice. Cool. Yeah. Um, you know, I go by uh, Crestbug Glass. You can find me on Instagram at a uh, Crestbug's Life or Crestbug Glass. Is that a K or a C? Um, it's K R E S. There's a there's a whole backstory to that name that we didn't get into. Well, tell us right now uh, while we're doing it. Oh no way! Oh come we'll on. We'll save that one. We'll <laughs> save that one for round two. How about it's it's really long. Okay. Um, I get. I, I, well, you're. You ever remember that show, Stifle and Ollie? No, I don't. From M- MTV, it was with sock puppets. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's this one episode, and there's like a dready sock puppet, and he's like, man, this shit's Crescent Fresh. And they're like, what is this Crescent Fresh thing? And he's like, you know, it's just like Crescent Fresh. And it just became one of those things in our crew to where like everything was like, yo, what's Crest? What's good? And it just like... uh it grew from there. Hilarious. <laughs> uh, but it, you know, it originated from Syphil and Ollie and the little Wook, uh, the Wook sock puppet. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> um, so where were we? I guess I'm on Facebook too, Crestbug. You want to see some family photos, check it out. <laughs> you know, you'll catch a lot of family stuff in my in my feed too. Cool. Um, Colorado Color Company Color is Colorado Color Company on Instagram, Facebook as well. Um, what was, what was the other thing we were parting piece of advice there? Oh yeah. Real quick too. And you guys, uh, you guys sell your materials, uh, through uh, the DNL and then, uh, Oh yeah. Yeah. So we have, we deal with DNL in Denver local spot. Great to us. Um, we also get a ton of color from those guys cause we can hand select it. Um, would re- highly recommend it if you're ever in Colorado, go check them out. Um, UST, we get all our clear from them. They carry our products. Pacific Art Glass in California is just getting a case. Um, there's a place in Canada. I can't recall their name. They're a new account as well. Um, and I wish I could. Sorry, guys, if you hear this. Yeah, man, if you, if you remember um, what it is, too, hit me up with it. I'll second put it in the show notes. Okay. And then, uh, man, there, there's a couple other once man i'm, I'm blanking now oh, it's cool. <laughs> that, you guys have your big cartel too right um no it's an etsy we moved oh, etsy, to etsy right. you know, since, right. since we're not selling pipes on there it, etsy is a great platform for us you know it, it carries a lot of the shipping the accounting the like you know where our business is coming from it it's great for us eventually we're going to move into our own website but you know it's just me and smash glass at the moment doing this thing so um, Etsy's been a great platform for us. Um, you can go Colorado Color Company, Etsy. It, the link's in our IG bio and our Facebook. Um, that's where you can uh, purchase the tubing from the color company. Awesome. And now it's time for your advice. Hey, um, I just say, you know, work hard, be honest, be a good person, be true to your word, and good things will come. Hell yeah. Well said. Well, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this interview with Sam, and we're going to have uh, Mr. Smash Glass on here eventually to talk about the whole, the true story behind Colorado Color Company and and Smash's uh, oh, background yeah. as well. You know, get get to talk on in there. I'm excited for that whole conversation. It'll be a fun little little round table. Oh, yeah, and uh, yeah, that dude's a, yeah. dude's on point. Great conversation. One of the most well spoken, knowledge cats I know. Hell yeah! Um, I imagine that'll be a good interview. Yeah, and then stay tuned because we uh, got some exciting news with you guys kind of joining in here and just helping support the show too. So I can't wait to uh, spill the beans on that a little little uh, 
teaser spoiler kind of deal for everybody. And uh, in the meantime, definitely go check these guys out on Instagram. Get some of their tubing in your life. They save you a lot of time and money And when it comes to creating your own tubes. They got a variety of stuff, and they got great quality materials, and they're all great guys. So go check them out. And Yeah. Definitely appreciate it. You know, we also, we also do uh, custom back sacks, too. If anybody has any uh, certain patterns they would like, we have a whole rate and fee thing for, you know, build your own back stack pretty much. You have to buy the whole stack, but... Um, if anybody's ever interested in that, that is also a possibility. We don't really advertise it, but we do do it. Awesome. Hell yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, until next time, hope you guys enjoy this interview with Sam and definitely go check them out on the social webs. And until next time, talk to you on the Wise Guy Radio Show. Have a wise day. Peace. Thank you.